Uh, thank you. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes, and then we'll continue uh, as we go. In 2020, President Biden said, quote, I want to look, I want you to look at my eyes. I guarantee you, I guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuel. He has regrettably kept this promise by canceling lease sales, trying to raise royalty and bond rates and massively subsidizing unreliable alternative energy sources. The federal government has waged war on the free market and tried everything they can to end fossil fuel usage. Despite this monumental and unprecedented government overreach, energy derived from fossil fuels has only fallen from 86% in 2000 to 84% today. That's a 2% drop in 23 years. In other words, uh, this war against fossil fuels has done nothing to curb Americans' need for affordable and reliable energy. So Mr. Um, Danos, what will happen to the price of energy if there are no offshore lease sales until 2025? Well, as you pointed out, the demand's not going anywhere. We can't, we can't flip a switch and move to renewables immediately. We're, we're going to have a long-term and need a long-term transition. So uh, that's going to increase prices, right? The, the, the predictability that comes with leases allows investment. That investment's going to lead to, to production. And that this is low-cost, reliable energy, uh, environmentally responsible, the lowest, cleanest barrels in the world right here. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the U.S., and that's going to keep energy prices down. Well, thank you. Uh, higher energy prices hurt working families, which is so ironic when I hear the other side profess to sympathize with the struggles of working families. Their stated goal is to artificially raise prices in order to wean us off of fossil fuels, no matter how much that hurts working families. Uh, Mr. Menorevic, I hope I said that right, how does private industry respond with regard to investment and exploration when the government refuses to hold lease sales? And of course, that includes offshore leasing, which is the subject of our hearing this morning, as well as onshore leasing, which affects my and hurts my state of Colorado. Yeah, you know, the leasing issue is, as I mentioned earlier, is a longer term issue. It's not going to affect activity and prices in 2024, it's more of a longer term issue. But these, all these issues chill the offshore industry, chill investment into that industry, chill desire to want to work there because of the uncertainty. Businesses want to work in a certain environment. And you know, your point about energy prices being low, we have to have uh, production to meet the demand. If we're going to transition away from oil, we have to have a healthy economy. We have to have low energy prices. That's what will allow us to transition. If prices go up, as we saw in 22, we start doing things like releasing from the strategic reserve, which we can't do any longer, and ultimately we'll have impairments to our economy, which will slow the transition. Um, so lease sales are important. They're on a longer term basis. It allows us to continue to offset those declines that I mentioned earlier. Okay, thank you. Um, we know now that renewables cannot make up for fossil fuels. Wind and solar only make up 11% of our nation's electricity. And electricity is only 38% of the total energy consumption as a nation. So Mr. Danos or Mr. Manerovic, knowing that renewables cannot substitute for fossil fuels, at least in the foreseeable future, where does, how will the deficit of energy be met if the United States stops producing oil and gas, which some of our people, uh, colleagues on the other side want to do. Yeah, it's pretty simple. It's going to come from other countries around the world, right? So we're trading those barrels again for barrels produced uh, in, in other countries around the world. We're giving up our energy security when we're doing that. We're giving up uh, the, the cleanest barrels in the world, low, lowest carbon intensity barrels for uh, 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 in exchange for barrels produced elsewhere. Yeah, I'd just like to add that, you know, I think that some oil can come from other countries, but as we meet these, try to meet these demand forecasts that EIA is suggesting, and also IEA and a lot of other organizations project the similar increases in demand, that ultimately there'll be a rationalization of price and we'll have higher prices, which was mentioned earlier, will impact the lower and middle income families of America the most. <coughs> higher energy prices is a regressive tax on middle and lower income families. 
and I'm going to make an editorial comment and then hand it back to the chairman who's returned to the room here. Um, I don't mind seeing the government incentivize alternatives and renewables and things like that, but when they go further and mandate that we can't use certain kinds of fuels that are traditionally part of our energy mix, to me that crosses the line and becomes manipulation and interference and trying to control and run our lives. And um, as a freedom-loving American and as someone who respects the free market, I just think that that's going too far. And I wish that that wasn't part of the mix. Uh, Mr. Chairman, back to you. The chair now recognizes for five minutes uh, Representative Kamala Gurdell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I was sort of struck by some of the opening comments uh, and testimony suggesting that the Biden administration has threatened economic prosperity when news has just come out today um, confirming how healthy the U.S. economy is. 